Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the most interesting people and huge stars too. A man who changed the world is arguably the father of the MP3. I'm delighted to welcome today Nathan Charloff. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It is nice to be on. Lovely to talk to you. I mean, your life is extraordinary. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you know that you were smarter than everyone else and could change the world forever? Well... I'm still trying to figure that out, actually. Uh, I, I would have a normal life like everybody else. Mm. You basically came up with this concept of an audio device that enabled us to listen to music and podcasts and things. I suppose it was prior to podcasts. They hadn't even been invented yet, which became the MP3 player. It was the Listen Up player originally. Did you know you were onto something when you came up with this concept? You know, I did. I did. And, and it wasn't, everybody thinks that, oh, it was a natural, that it just became a big success. I actually knew it would be. I had the vision of downloadable devices and even onto telephones. And this was 1994. Mm. Uh, and people did not get it. Uh, I actually originally financed the company and raised $8 million over three years at ten to $25,000 at a time wow. because venture capitalists wouldn't touch it. They did not believe in it. What an incredible thing. So let's go back to the beginning. So you were sat there one day and you thought, why haven't we got something in our pocket where we can listen to stuff? Was that the basic thought? Well, you know, it's an interesting story. And that's the number one question I get. How did you think of the MP3 player? And actually, I did a company called Test Drive, which I sold to a large conglomerate in 1993. And uh, it was R.R. Donnelly and Sons out of Chicago who I sold it to. And what this company did was it had an encryption software uh, technique that we would put $50,000 worth of software on a CD. CDs were just becoming popular at the time. And they were external devices on computers in 1992. The individual could try this software four or five times, then would lock up. If they wanted to purchase it, they could do it over the phone and instantly get a code, and it would underlock, it would randomly unlock each individual piece of software that they purchased. Wow. Well, when I sold that company, I was thinking, well, what do I want to do next? You know, for me, a job was out of the question. I really never had a real job. Hmm. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, if we can do this with software, we should be able to do it with music. People shouldn't have to buy a whole album or a whole CD because they liked one song. And I saw the vision of where the computers were going. And by 1995, I could see other devices coming up and even phones. I actually did an interview on the radio with a, a station, which I still have out of Amsterdam. And he sent it to me about two years ago, uh, the interview again saying, you know, you predicted all this and you were exactly right. And yes, I did see that vision. Uh, that's actually why I wrote my book, Father of the MP3 Player. Mm. I share the most remarkable stories of what it was like to, to start a company in 1994 and take it up into the year 2000s and, and, and see the world change, the world of music. Uh, my book, Father of the MP3 Player, which can be bought on Amazon or in bookstores. And of course, you can read the book for free uh, via Amazon if you're on Prime as well. So uh, an amazing bargain there. Um, your insight is fascinating. I guess with anything, you have to have the right time, the right place, a bit of luck and some alchemy. And all the stars aligned with this project, didn't it? It was just ahead of the wave of computers and laptops and iPads and all that stuff. And now, of course, we take it all for granted. But back then, this stuff was, was the thing of fantasy, wasn't it? Totally. Totally. It, it really was. I always say being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff and mm -hmm. building an airplane on the way down. Right. I mean, wow. you're, you're, you're doing the end. And really, technology is still that way. There are still things in the future that are going to be just as remarkable and make significant changes. Uh, I know Facebook has some bad feelings in the air right now with the political environment, but mm. Facebook made a major difference in communication in our world. Uh, in my opinion. Are there still things to achieve? I mean, if I'd have said to you in 1994 that one day we'd be talking over a phone via an app through Wi-Fi, you'd have probably laughed. Is anything still possible, or do you think we, we've reached our peak and from now on it's just little tweaks? Oh, 
I think we've only begun. <laughs> really? I think there's so many great things that are going to happen in energy. There's something called quantum entanglement, which was a theory by Albert Einstein and Tesla in mm. 1938. Uh, with this, if you let your imagination go, people could possibly fly or use a time machine. Mm. I mean, is that so outrageous today as things, if I would have told you what today looks like in 1965? Uh, no, it is. Well, the driverless cars thing is the thing that blows my mind, is that we're very close to that becoming a thing, certainly in California. It seems like they've almost got it down, I know. But it seems like this technology, the remote technology that, that thinks for itself, is, is almost there, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. And, you know, these are things that are here on the horizon today. We can't begin to think of what our future 10 years are going to be like. Uh, we're only limited by our imagination mm. and I truly believe that mm. and then we look at how it changed your life we know how you've changed ours we all wanted uh, this technology in our pocket and we all have it via the iPhone or whatever system it's called now how did it change your life financially are you a billionaire no I'm not a billionaire but it, it changed my life financially substantially it, mm. it uh, from the time I, I was always I I've been associated with Apple computers since 1988 in one form or the other. Mm. Uh, I developed one of their best-selling word processors called Word Handler and List Handler in 1980. Uh, actually, most recently, I was a part of the Samsung uh, legal case uh, when Apple sued Samsung. I was an expert witness and worked on that for a few years. Uh, it changed my life substantially from allowing me to see visions of believing in the impossible. Mm. Were you uh, always excited by infinite possibilities as a child? Was this always something that you aspired to be, a creator and innovator? Yes, I was. Uh, and, I, and I still am. Uh, I, I believe the most important thing in my success is that I have passion. Mm. And I think passion is, if you have passion, you can accept failure and move on. Mm. And without getting too geeky, was there a point where you thought you couldn't make the MP3 player work or be feasible or possible? Or was it always just a question of finding the right technology to get it in people's pockets? Only about 100 times. Wow. <laughs> the most important part in any recommendation I can give to young entrepreneurs is make sure you have enough money. My hardest obstacle was always raising money. I raised a hundred. I raised eight million from private individuals, angel investors. Then, with public offerings and other monies, I raised another sixty million uh, wow. to, to make my dream come true. Uh, we also did the really the first commercial music download in the industry, and, and we did the first cybercast, which can be seen on my YouTube channel, which was uh, covered by Entertainment Tonight. We had eighty thousand people in the stands. Uh, over 2 million people we broadcast to with Ricky wow. Martin, Britney Spears, Will Smith, and an all-day concert. It was, it was amazing. Is there any way of describing the excitement when you finally got it to work and that it was a thing that would end up changing the world and the way we listen to music? Well, when we got it to work was about 1995. It didn't become popular really to about 2004, you know, although we were shipping and making them. My most exciting time was probably during our public offering because we had so much exposure, the world finally got to really, really see it. The public mm -hmm. offering made a difference. It also gave us the money that we needed and our, our money worries were behind us. Changed the life financially of many of my employees. Wow. And how big was the team? We started out with about six people. Within the first year, we were up to 30. Wow. <clears throat> Uh, by the year 2000, we were probably about 130. That's, that's insane, isn't it? And a huge responsibility. And of course, if it didn't work, where do you go from there? I wonder, in terms of the, the, the copyright and protecting it, how do you stop somebody nicking your idea so that you don't put in the hard work and then some big conglomerate steals it once it's well, ready to go? Early on, uh, I had a patent expert as part of our staff. Mm. And we were continually filing patents. We have six strong patents, which uh, are in public domain today because it's been so long. Uh, but we copyrighted everything. We filed patent. A story that I like to share that we did not copyright is when we were developing uh, our back end, the iTunes 
uh, part of it, where you could actually take software. Mm -hmm. We had a creative director who I'm still friends with named Ted Richards. And we would meet every week to see how people were working on their part, on the music part, the content part. And Ted was the creative director. And his, his problem, he said, was how is he going to take the music uh, from our site and sell it and give it to you? Because this had never done before. Hmm. So one day he came in our meeting and said, I figured it out last night. I'm going to do it the same as a supermarket. I'm going to give you a shopping cart. You will take the music. You will put it in a shopping cart. When you're done shopping, you'll check out and pay for it. Hmm. We never copyrighted it, but boom, the shopping cart was invented. Wow. <laughs> we were focused on the MP3 player. Isn't that interesting how just by pure chance you came across another thing that would revolutionize the way we shop? And I have to ask about the music industry because, of course, they weren't best pleased because it suddenly devalued their monopoly on us buying CDs and uh, albums as it was back then. Do you have any sympathy with them that this technology has sort of made record companies redundant, although it's given infinite power to, to the artists themselves? Well, back then, the record industry was controlled and run by a bunch of fat old, old men. I don't know <laughs> that they're fat, I use that. Uh, uh, they really weren't into music as so much as they are today. Right. They were into numbers and business. So they could not really, really see the vision. They were primarily playing to things like Tower Records, large record companies, because uh, the, the internet was not large enough to give them the base that they needed. Mm. Uh, what really, really changed this, and I have to give credit to Apple Computer, was they did it. They took what I did and had a, a full... The, the full suite, the back end, the front end, easy to use. And the most important part was prior to Apple, everyone was selling what they call independent music, which was music from bands nobody heard of. Mm -hmm. And quite enough money to go around to the record companies, throw cash at them, scare them a little bit, and put all this together. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was simple and plug and play. And boom, we, there was a success. And that's where it began. I can't tell you how much I love it. I think anybody of my generation uh, that grew up just on the sort of periphery of the breakthrough of the internet and online just couldn't live without it now. I mean, we take our radio station with us, and I suppose that's another thing I should ask you about. You have made radio redundant because we're all our own program controllers now. We have it the power to play the songs we want to hear and not play the songs we don't want to hear. It's totally, totally. And, you know, younger people don't even understand that. But uh, I grew up with that, and it was frustrating to have to buy a whole album when mm -hmm. I wanted one song. I also saw the vision of the Internet as a distribution channel mm -hmm. where it should be quick, and uh, people want it now. Uh, our society is built on instant gratification. Mm -hmm. As we sit here today, how do you feel? I mean, you must be incredibly proud. You see everybody with these phones that we're all now glued to. You're part of the reason of that, because it's no longer a telephone. The last thing we use a phone for is to phone. True. It puts a smile on my face hmm. when I see people listening to music on their phone or any kind of device. It makes me feel good. It, it really does. Uh, I was asked once many years ago when that I, when will I know the MP3 player was a success? This was probably 1998. And my answer was when every teacher in every school hates me. Right. Do you have any conscience about that? Is it your job or Apple's job or any of the other people's job to worry about the obsession and the fact that now we don't go in bars to meet people, we get laid through the app and we don't go and listen to a radio station with a DJ, we do it through an app and we don't do personal phone calls now because we text them. Is there any moral obligation to you to protect us from ourselves? Uh, the moral obligation, you know, I don't make guns. Uh, I make yes. music. Yes. Uh, so the moral <laughs> obligation, I really lay on the in individual. Uh, I do think that is a real issue when I see people that don't put their phones down. And I, I, I try not to emulate that. Mm. Uh, something Steve Jobs himself used to say all the time. But do I think that it's made a better world or a worse world? I think it's made a better world. If I'd go back as again to 1965 and say in... This little device that I carry around, I can get any kind of information. I can put my whole life. You wouldn't believe it. Mm. Uh, 
it's amazing. And I think the benefits outweigh, uh, outweigh the liabilities. In my book, I, I, I outline several stories. I'll tell you, my life has been a series of dysfunctional events hmm. that has allowed for a wonderful life. Uh, my whole life was my work. I rarely sleep. I would actually work about 18 hours a day, and most of my life would sleep only four hours a night. I would travel to several countries a month. I'm a pilot, so I've flown myself all, all around the world. And I worked so hard, I had a serious illness that took eight years to recover and went into a coma. So that's what changed my life. I, I, and all I, this is in my book. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's truly an interesting story. I wonder whether you have to be an obsessive to be as successful as you are. I wonder whether you have to be OCD with the finer details, because if not, nothing would be this perfect, would it? Uh, I would have to agree with that. Mm. Uh, but there, there are some people that aren't, that are, are more steady. Uh, but most of the entrepreneurs that are successful and have made changes that I have met, and I have met several, uh, are passionate and obsessive on what they're doing. Or another way of saying it, they're very focused. Yeah. Why can't you sleep? Are you too busy thinking or you just can't sleep? Well, again, my whole life was my work. And I would be in the office from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. Mm. And I would jump on my plane and I would head somewhere for a morning meeting. So I just actually got used to sleeping four hours a night. Uh, these days, it's more of a hindrance. It's uh, I don't enjoy it because my life is not as active as it was mm. uh, a few years ago. They claim yeah. Margaret Thatcher only used to get four hours of sleep a night, and it didn't seemingly do her career any harm. So maybe it's fine for some. It's been that way in, since I've been in my twenties. Uh, it really hasn't affected me, and I live with live with it well. Do you think one day we'll be talking about another book you've written about another instrument that changes the world? Is there something else planned? Well, I'm not a writer, but I think what we'll be talking about is another product I'm behind. And these days I'm more into green energy and uh, uh, stem cell technology. It was just interesting. Yesterday I was reading a report about multiple sclerosis and they found a way of helping that condition. Is this something you're passionate about now? Is, is the medical field and, and people saving lives? I'm, ever since my coma and it changed my life. Uh, things that I'm involved with, uh, one criteria is they need to make a, a real difference mm. in people's lives as far as health or living or, or energy. So I've been involved somewhat in India and Africa in uh, producing energy in homes that, no, that don't have electricity. 50% of our world has no electricity. And we've been using this with solar devices. I have a, a company I founded in 2010 called Solar Juice, uh, that's J-O-O-S, mm. that produces one of the leading solar chargers mm. in the world that's been instrumental in, in changing people's lives. I guess it's a similar thing to Trevor Bayliss, who we lost just very recently. And, you know, the wind up radio was one of those seminal moments that brought knowledge and information and communication to Africa. I guess with this new creation that you're working on, again, it could be a, just another step in the right direction to try and help them, because it does seem like we're going in circles with Africa. How do we stop it being corrupt? How do we stop people starving? How do we stop the obscene poverty that's going on? That's got to be our main focus, hasn't it, in this for this generation of people? Uh, I think so. I'm, I'm a globalist, not a nationalist. Uh, I, I see the world's problems uh, that are problems that belong to all of us. Mm. You are literally the American dream, and we congratulate you on the book, which is the inventor of the MP3 player. We congratulate you on changing the world and your success and being you. Nathan Shurloff, thank you so much for your time. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Uh, if I also just mention the name of my book, it's Father of the MP3 Player and can be found on Amazon or Barnes & Noble.